Thank you very much, Alice. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organising committee for inviting me um, and the sponsors as well. It's a real privilege to be here and to hopefully bring a subject that's very close to my heart into, into your hearts or at least into your awareness because working animals and particularly working horses and mules and donkeys tend to be very low on the radar of most people working in both animal contexts and in development contexts. And it's really important, I think, that as far as possible, I'm able to, to make people a bit more aware of them, a bit more aware of what they do and how important they are to people. And why that many people in the developing world would say that the most important things in their lives, the most important things in their world are carried on the back of working animals. So I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. The first one, I'll talk a little bit about the background, some facts and figures about working equine animals particularly, and their geographic and socio-economic distribution, and the types of work they do. And then I'll move on to looking at working equine animals through a livelihoods framework, the sustainable livelihoods framework that's used by the UK Department of International Development, which is the equivalent to CEDA in Canada. And in particular, looking at working equine animals as natural and financial capital and how they contribute to other forms of capital assets in a livelihoods framework. And I'll also mention a little bit of the work that I and others have done on working animals and women, how they support women, children and other vulnerable groups in society. And then the last part of my talk, um, I'll talk a little bit about, bit about the welfare and the health issues affecting working animals and also the opportunities and challenges that we have for improving welfare really under three categories or three headings. One is through participatory approaches with the owners of those animals, the service providers within their communities um, and, and the, the local context that they work in. One is improving animal health services, both the supply of quality animal health services and the demand for them among the communities that own working animals, and also through advocacy on a wider scale to bring awareness of their role to national and international audiences. Um, throughout this um, talk, I'm going to use quite a lot of photos to introduce people who have never seen or experienced, had a lot of experience with working animals to show you the kinds of things that they do and also some quotes from a recent study by Delphine Vallette who works for the Brook in our advocacy team who's done a study, um, a participatory qualitative study with women's focus groups in Ethiopia, um, Kenya, India and Pakistan and I'm bringing, although that, that study is about to be published, it's going to be launched next week in the, in the UK, I'm bringing some quotes from that study which really illustrate and bring home the value of these animals to women um, in the societies where they, where they work. So first of all, what are working animals? I'm going to put my working horses, mules and donkeys in a wider context. Um, many species are used for different kinds of work. And we see particularly draft work, carts, plowing, tillage, other forms of agriculture being done by buffalo and by cattle, oxen, bullocks, steers um, in many parts of South and East Asia and also in Africa and South and Central America. Yaks and zo, I don't know if anyone have come across those in their work or in their travels. Zo are a, a hybrid between a yak and a cow, so the equivalent of a mule in the bovine world. They're used for tillage and for, for packing in the Himalayan regions of Asia. Donkeys, mules and horses, which are going to be the focus of my talk and which are the focus of the Brooks' work, are used for a wide range of tasks. Draft again, ploughing, weeding, harrowing, pulling carts, a very important role for these animals, and also for carrying packs. And you can see virtually anything you can think of carried on the back of a horse or mule or donkey in the areas where they're really important for um, transport. And they're also used as riding animals for people to get from A to B to access important services. And you can see working donkeys, mules, and horses across wide areas of Africa, South Asia, South and Central America. They're still used quite extensively in Eastern Europe. And of course, the specialized Amish community in um, the USA who still use working horses for their transport and tillage needs. Camels are another species which I, which I 
love working with, although I don't get very many opportunities. They're used in Asia particularly for ploughing and also for carts, and for, they're used for packing and riding in other parts of the world. They're also used for, as, as a wealth um, species and for other forms of livestock use in Africa particularly. And in South Asia and Mongolia, you particularly see them used for transhumans, for migration, and for carrying the family's goods over long distances. Llamas are used for packing in South America, and elephants are used for logging and also for riding, sometimes for tourism, in, particularly in South and East Asia. So that puts my equine species in a bit of context. And there are approximately 250 million working animals worldwide. It, it's really hard to extract these figures from the FAO statistical database because it, that doesn't separate out working animals from other kinds of livestock, doesn't separate out working horses from sport horses, um, working donkeys from, from riding donkeys and so on. But we can estimate that there are approximately 112 million horses, mules and donkeys which will be working from those figures. And of those, there are about 57 million horses, about 11 million mules, and about 43 million donkeys. And most of those animals which are working are in low-income developing countries. And their numbers, contrary to what people expect, you know, we think of working animals, particularly working horses, as being in decline anywhere where there's economic growth. But Although they are declining in some areas, they're stable in other areas, and they're at, their numbers are actually growing in some areas of the world as well. So why do these fluctuations happen? Why do, we, why do people choose to use or not to use working animals? Well, they tend to replace working animals with motorized transport, where the motor vehicles are available and affordable, where they're profitable, and where they're socially acceptable. Now, social acceptability of motor vehicles in most places is not a problem. People want them if they fulfill the other criteria. And we've seen the, the auto rickshaw, the bajaj, the tuk-tuk, whatever you call it, taking over from, from working horses, particularly the Tonga taxi horses, in a lot of cities in the developing world. It tends to be that people move to motorised transport, obviously when they have more money for fuel, for maintenance, and in areas which are more fertile and more accessible, motorised transport obviously needs roads which are possible for it to use. People tend to replace human-powered tillage, agriculture and transport with working animals, when, again when the animals are available and adapted to the environment, when they're affordable and when they're socially acceptable. So there are growth areas, particularly donkeys in sub-Saharan Africa, where more and more people are taking on donkeys instead of doing the, the work through human labour. And in places such as um, cities in Kenya, where there's a lot of youth who are unemployed, Buying a donkey, starting up a small urban or peri-urban transport business is a growth area. And there are people coming into working with donkeys who have no previous experience with working animals. And that brings its own set of challenges. In West Africa, the donkey line the, where, where donkeys are being used is, is moving gradually southwards. More and more people are starting to use donkeys who haven't had donkeys before. But obviously in some countries or in some cultures, in some areas of some countries, women may not use donkeys, so this could be seen as a missed opportunity for people to be for women particularly to be able to replace some of their labor burdens, their physical burdens that they would normally carry themselves with a working animal. And people retain animal power in large areas of the, the developing world when it's profitable and social acceptable and where there are no easy alternatives. People may wish to have motorized power, but petrol prices are constantly rising, parts may be hard to find, vehicles may deteriorate even faster than animals under difficult conditions. So there are a lot of areas where the working animal populations are large and stable, and we see that across Asia, particularly India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and across um, large areas of Central and South America. So, in brief, a working horse or mule or donkey often supports five or more family members. So, if we have our 112 million working equines, you can, you can see that we're into the many hundreds of millions of people whose livelihoods um, are supported by these animals. 
And the people who own working equine animals are often very poor. They're not always the poorest, but many of them will be earning around about the $2 a day mark. There's a cost element to owning any animal, the cost of buying it, the cost of keeping it, and also for working animals, the cost of equipment, a pack saddle, a cart, a plow, whatever that needs to be done with it. So the extremely vulnerable, marginalized, poorest can't afford working animals in the first place. The people who own working animals will get an income often from renting out that animal for, to other users. So that will, again, raise their, their socioeconomic status slightly compared to the poorest people who don't have them. People who hire working animals tend to have more precarious livelihoods because they have to go out every day, they have to pay money to hire the animal and then they don't know if they will or won't get work that day. So they tend to be um, a different category of, of, animal, of people who work animals because their challenges are different from somebody who actually owns the animal. So the, the framework that I've decided to use, because I could stand here and give you a whole long list of, of all the, the ways in which working animals contribute to people's lives, but, uh, but it helps me and it probably helps other people to put those in the context of a framework which many of you may be familiar with. Um, this is the Sustainable Livelihoods um, Framework, um, which was developed in 1998 for the UK Department for International Development. And this is used in all sorts of development context. There have been others, obviously, more recently, but this is a, a useful one to come back to. And this, this looks at livelihoods in the, at, in the vulnerability context of people's livelihoods, so the shocks and the trends, the changes in weather and prices and crops and so on according to the season. It looks at livelihood assets under five categories. So the Pentagon represents capital assets which contribute to a livelihood. It looks at the transforming structures and processes which influence the vulnerability context of um, people living a livelihood. And then it looks at the livelihood strategies that they adopt in order to get improved outcomes such as more income, increased well-being, reduced vulnerability, improved food security, and more sustainable use of their natural resource base. So owning a working animal is a livelihood strategy. It may be one of many livelihood strategies that people use in order to improve their livelihood outcomes. And in the next few slides, I'm just going to look at the way that working animals contribute to these five areas of capital. So how they contribute to human capital, health, knowledge, skills, information, and ability to labor how they contribute to natural um, capital, in particular to land, water, environmental resources, how they contribute to financial capital, which is obviously very important for a lot of the, the people that use working animals. So regular remittances, savings, credit, how it how helps a family to earn money on a day-to-day -day basis. Physical capital, and this is a very important area that working animals contribute to, Water, again, comes into this. Transport, communications, and housing is another important area. And of course, traction energy is the product that working animals produce. Other, other productive livestock will produce milk, meat, wool, whatever, something that's saleable. What animals are, are producing is traction energy, draft energy. And also social capital, an important one that's often overlooked, um, the contribution of working animals to relationships between people, to membership of groups and networks, and to be able to access other institutions. So first of all, human capital. I've got a few photos here. Um, one of the most important contributions that working animals make, particularly in, in Africa, in Ethiopia, for example, which has a third of Africa's donkeys, um, between six and seven million donkeys, almost every household living in rural and semi-rural areas will own at least one donkey. And one of the major uses for this donkey is reducing the household burden of women's chores, but in particular, the daily collection of water and firewood. So if you own a donkey, you may only have to go and get water, collect water or firewood twice a week instead of every day. And that contributes to human capital in terms of better health and also a lot more time for doing other things. 
On the top right, there's a picture um, of a young man um, called Asim and his donkey and his father, who is a landmine um, victim from Afghanistan. And this donkey was um, used as a case study by the Brook to demonstrate how a donkey could support somebody who otherwise would have a lot of difficulty with, with transport and access. On the bottom left there, schools transport in Kenya and Ethiopia and many other countries, children are able to get to school on a donkey cart or on the donkey itself. And this may enable them to get to schools which are further away, um, more difficult to access. And on the bottom right, there are donkey ambulances in Afghanistan. In, it's one of the countries, including Ethiopia and many countries in West Africa, where donkey ambulances, horse ambulances, whether directly riding or on carts, is a very important way for people to access health services where they would otherwise have quite a lot of difficulty in doing so. So I've mentioned access to health services that involves transporting people to health posts, to hospitals, to maternity clinics. Also, we have examples of where the animals have been used in the other direction. So a charity called, an NGO called TB Alert, uses in, in some of their remote area projects, uses donkeys to transport um, TB medicines, drugs, to the remote areas for people to, to get them. If, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a donkey that's carrying firewood, that's carrying water, women often report less tiredness, less back pain, less neck pain. They have to make fewer journeys. They have, they have more energy for doing other tasks. They have more time for childcare and for other work. And they have better access to good sources of food. They can get to market. They can bring back more than they would have been able to. To, to carry otherwise. They can keep cows at home where the donkey will bring fodder or will bring water so they can have milk for their children. They can harvest more efficiently from their land. So again, they have a, a wider source of nutrition. And something which I hadn't really thought enough about until I read some of the quotes from Delphine Vallette's report, um, the one I mentioned earlier, is that women told her in, in the focus groups, particularly in Africa, that because I have a donkey, I now don't have to leave my baby or my young child at home, either unaccompanied or in the care of other children, because I can put the child on my back and the donkey will carry the, the water or the, the firewood. So that makes a, a huge difference to the quality of childcare and the safety of children if they can go with their mothers and be carried to do these jobs rather than being left alone at home. Access to schools and transport I've mentioned already. And also, if the donkey is doing the work or the horse is doing the work, children often don't have to accompany their mothers to carry the water or to carry the firewood and collect it. They can attend school instead of working. And there's more money in the family to pay for school fees, books, uniforms, all the other costs associated with education. Now, natural capital, Again, working animals are used for many different agricultural practices. Um, the top picture is from Mali. It's a horse plowing. They're also used for harrowing. Their donkeys are often used for weeding. If a family owns a donkey and they plant their, their um, crops in rows rather than by random spreading of the seed, then they can use the donkey and a weeder to weed their crops. Weeding is almost always the women's job on the farmstead, on the shamba, and it's a back-breaking job. A lot of bending down, weeding with a hand hoe, and if they, can, if they own a donkey and they can arrange their, agricult their homestead agriculture so that the donkey can weed, can weed, again, that frees up a lot of women's time and effort. And the picture on the bottom left is from Pakistan. It's a, um, a horse being used to harvest alfalfa, and previous to that, it's been harvesting sugarcane. Um, if People can bring in, if they can use a working animal for harvest instead of backloading or headloading from the fields, they can bring in the harvest more efficiently, they can market the harvest more efficiently, they've got less chance of spoilage on the field or wastage, fewer journeys, and they can cover longer distances. I've mentioned water, this comes up all the time, and I think it was mentioned in one of the previous talks about, you know, how do animals contribute to, to water security or water availability for households? And working, working equine animals are absolutely critical for this across many of the countries um, where the brook works. Either this kind of commercial water drawing where 
Teams of donkeys will be used to bring large quantities of water on carts, and then the water will be taken into towns and cities and sold to the urban dwellers, or for homestead water drawing where, and it will be the water needed for an individual family that's brought by the donkey. Often then it's packed rather than carted from the water point. And it enables people to have a bit more choice about their water source. Instead of going to the nearest water source, they can go further afield and go to the cleaner water source. So the implications of that can be, can be very important for health. And another contribution that working animals make to natural capital, which is really important and often overlooked, is that they fetch fodder and water for other livestock. So other animals on the farm depend often on the donkey or on the working horse to bring their fodder, to bring their livestock. In some countries we see cattle particularly being grazed over extensive rangelands, but in countries like Ethiopia the cattle are kept close to home and most of the feed for them is cut and carry, often the water is brought to them. So without the donkey there wouldn't be the cows, without the cows there wouldn't be the milk, so there's a, a ripple effect, a knock-on effect from the donkey into the other um, farm species and into the, producti the productivity of the household livestock as a whole. And we mustn't forget that a working animal is itself a form of natural capital because it's a natural resource as well as contributing to other forms of natural capital. They, they produce manure, which can be used as a fertilizer. We've been working with an organization called the um, Kenya Network for the Dissemination of Agricultural Technologies who are promoting donkeys as friendly animals for soil tillage. They, when they're plowing, they don't disrupt the soil as much as working with cattle or with motor vehicles. And so they can help contribute to um, more friendly forms of soil management. And as this quote says from, from a woman in a, a group in Kenya as part of um, Delphine Vallette's study, farming is made possible by the donkeys. And this is really often overlooked in studies of livestock development. Cattle are talked about, sheep and goats are talked about, but in many places they wouldn't be able to be farmed without the donkey or the horse making that possible. Financial capital, this is the thing we always think about, bringing in the money. And in the countries where, where we work in, in India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Egypt, Kenya, and um, in Central, Central America, they are really important sources of income for the family, direct income and indirectly. So rural small businesses, urban small businesses, and in towns and cities you will see them carrying absolutely anything you can think of on a cart. Coca-Cola fridges, gas bottles, um, vegetables from the market, anybody moving house you'll see the whole of the family's furniture piled precariously on the back of a cart going through the streets. And I wish that, in the, that I had started a list 15 years ago, because I'm sure now it would, it would take up hundreds of pages of all the things that I've seen carried on, on carts with, pulled by horses or mules or donkeys. Tourism is an important part of um, the, the financial capital that working horses contribute to in some parts of the world. Egypt springs to mind. Jordan, if anybody's been to Petra, you will have seen working donkeys and horses and camels at the World Heritage Site there. Um, Morocco, Marrakesh has working horses. You will find those in, in pockets doing, doing tourism um, in all kinds of places. Marketing farm produce, I've talked a little bit about that already. Whatever's brought from the farm can be put on the back of a cart, can be taken to a market, and that can be a market that's a little bit further away and a little bit more profitable rather than the very local one. Often in the case of this um, donkey in Egypt, then the donkey then becomes the market stall and stands there all day with the, with the brakes on while the produce is sold from the back of the cart. Um, and this really enables people to access markets or to access roadheads. Um, for example, in Ethiopia, where a lot, of, a lot of the population live in very remote areas, the working animal can get the produce to the roadhead. It'll then be trans transferred to a pickup or a lorry in larger quantities to be taken on and sold in the city. And coffee is very difficult to get information about. But if you look at the, the blogs and the websites of coffee producers, it seems that most of the world's coffee that you will get in Starbucks or anywhere else um, has been carried on the back of a donkey or a mule or a horse. At some point, it's coming out of the mountains. It has to come down those mountain tracks 
on the back of a horse or a mule or a donkey. So these things are surprising to, to a lot of us that, that things that we might use every day have, have quite possibly had a, had a journey on the back of a donkey. So again, a working animal is itself a form of financial capital and it also contributes to other forms of financial capital. I've talked a little bit about direct earnings, how they can be rented out, or direct payments can be gained from taxi or transport services, and also indirect earnings from agricultural use or from transport. Something that's, that comes up over and over again as we start to see more socioeconomic studies of working animals is savings. The fact that the time or money or labor saved would otherwise have had to be paid for in some way. People who don't have animals, working animals, have to pay people who do to rent the animals in order to get the work done, or they miss out. And of course, like cattle, working animals can be a source of emergency cash or a loan guarantee. Physical capital, um, brick kilns are where bricks are produced, factories where bricks are produced, particularly in countries like Egypt, India, Nepal, Pakistan, are very large employers of, of working animals. Um, they either on carts, as you see in the, in the photo from Egypt there, or in packs, mostly in, in Asia, you'll find donkeys and ponies and mules working in brick kilns, carrying huge loads of bricks, because the way the kilns are designed it takes a, a small cart that can carry the wet bricks from where they've been formed and dried in the sun into the entrance of the kiln where they're then stacked and fired. And anyone who's been on holiday to Egypt will have stayed in a hotel that's built with bricks that have been moved in this way by donkeys. There are 300 plus brick kilns on the outskirts in, in an area called Helwan on the outskirts of Cairo, and that's where all the bricks come from for building the city. Transport, I've mentioned before, getting from A to B, fetching fuel, fetching water, fetching timber from, from the forest for building. This, this group of um, young lads, in, I met them in the Rift Valley in Kenya, and they were bringing their donkeys back with with um, timber that somebody else had felled, but they were transporting it back to the village to help with house building. So at household level, some of these things I've, I've mentioned earlier, you will see all kinds of house building material transported by working animals. And at national level, road construction, railway construction, maintenance of, of railways, bringing the, bringing the sleepers, bringing the sand, bringing the gravel for the railways, often on the back of donkeys and mules. Brick kilns and factories I've talked about, and that's a, a view of a brick kiln in Pakistan which uses mule and horse carts to move the bricks. And also you find working animals in mines and quarries. There are a few um, coal mines in Pakistan, shallow mines which use donkeys to bring the coal out. They're often found in rock quarries, flint quarries, um, gravel, and also river sand. Sand's very important for the basis of um, a lot of construction, and you'll find horses working up to their chests in rivers while their owners dredge out the river sand, put it in packs on their backs, and bring it out. So both the animals and the people who work them have, have hard lives, often in very difficult conditions. And our last form of capital that's considered in the, in the DFID Sustainable Livelihoods framework, the importance of, of the social value of working animals. Work, as I've said before, taking time, giving women time for social activities, for meeting their friends, for being part of the community, and for, for doing the activities that make them a woman, you know, for being able to, to talk and, and look after children and, and all these things which which contribute to, to what they want to do with their lives rather than just doing the household drudgery, the household chores, the household work. Sharing with relatives and, and neighbors helps to, to bond the, family, the extended family and the community. Working animals are a form of status. People who have them tend to be better off in terms of status than people who don't. This is a, a little boy outside one of our clinics in Egypt, very proud of his donkey, very proud that his father owns a donkey. Um, and this is obviously something which, for his peer group, he will, will make him feel important and he will want to, to look after that donkey and make sure that it, that it lives a long time and helps him as well as he gets older. And access to institutions is, is also important. Trying to register a birth, a death, a marriage, or to get hold of 
um, a card that entitles you to government benefits often means traveling a long distance to a, to a you know, a principal town in the, in the area in order to stand in a queue and, and sign a load of forms. And it may be very difficult for people to get there if they don't have motorized transport, unless they have a nice fast donkey cart and, or a horse to ride in order to do that. And so this enabling capacity that working animals have to get people access to other things that they need is very important. So here are some quotes again from some of the women who, who took part in the study. Um, they have social groups which, which are very important within their lives and where you pay a subscription fee. So the subscription fee comes from the money that's earned from the horses and donkeys. And also if you can lend your animal, if you can contribute to social events, to festivals, to weddings, to somebody's funeral, by lending your animal, maybe decorating it, by providing your horse to a groom who's riding to his wedding, then that can, can very much elevate your social standing and make you feel a better part of your community. I'm just going to mention now, having talked a little bit about these forms of capital, the Millennium Development Goals, nobody can, nobody can claim that working animals are visible in these at all in any obvious way. You wouldn't look at any of the, the targets for the Millennium Goals and think, oh, working animals must contribute to that. But if you actually look at them, you can see probably from what I've been describing how that little thread of the contribution of a working horse or mule or donkey will come into, into most of those in some way. That those several hundred million people who rely on their working animals will be getting a benefit which will contribute in some way to most of these, these goals. I'm going to move on just briefly to talk about something which isn't mentioned, obviously, in the Sustainable Livelihood Strategy, human, humanitarian emergency relief. Um, we have a, a large number of staff working in Pakistan. Pakistan's our biggest um, area of operation. And our staff were very much involved in the um, Pakistan earthquake emergency in 2005 with the epicenter in Muzaffarabad. And the official death toll from that earthquake was... 75,000 people, although it was estimated to be probably closer to 100,000, and nearly 140,000 people with serious injuries in an area that was extremely remote and extremely difficult to access by helicopter or by vehicle transport. And organizing a donkey train, a long um, train of donkeys which carried food and water and blankets and aid, medical supplies into the mountains at a very early stage. Our teams were on the ground three, two to three days after the emergency and to bring injured people out to areas which were more accessible for trucks and for helicopters um, was something that we felt was a, a really useful contribution and showed that sometimes these animals are the only way to get somewhere and the fastest way to get somewhere in a, in a time of dire need. And the Swiss NGO was using um, a group of mules for the same purpose and we were able to help them as well in managing their, their mules because they didn't have experience of um, working animals before. There are also several examples of working animals helping people to cope with and recover from stresses and shocks. These are two quotes from um, North Darfur during the famine and during the war displacement where people who were asked um, what they would like to support a return to their home said, first we need security and second we need donkeys. And when they were asked, why donkeys? You know, what, th that hadn't occurred to us as being something that you would, you would ask for as a high priority. The people said, with the donkeys, we can get everything else we need. Without the donkeys, that becomes very difficult for us. And during, during the famine, people recognizing the importance of their donkeys actually cut back on their own purchases and their own food in order to make sure that their, their livestock, including their donkeys, survived. So how well are working animals currently recognized? Animal owners, as I've shown, are fully aware of the role and value of their working animals. And this is um, Delphine's study, which is being um, launched next week um, to the UK All Parliamentary Group on Food and Agriculture. Um, there's a lot of examples in here. It's a, a qualitative study with a lot of examples from these 22 focus groups of um, how working animals, and particularly working donkeys, help women, and in women's own words, 
how much how important they are. So look out for that one. That will be available online as an online publication. This is a table from the um, from from the report on that study, and um, it shows the direct and indirect use of working animals and the savings that can be made from them. And really, um, what I'd like you to take away from this is the wide range of uses that a working, a working animal, particularly a working donkey, has. These are not single-use animals. They're doing a lot of different things for women. And here's a, here's a quote which, again, um, takes me back to the title of, of my presentation, The World on Their Backs. For, the, for this woman in Kenya, she describes that the donkey does everything for her. It, it fetches water. She does the laundry. She does the dishes, cleans the house, bathes, cooks the meals with the sawdust, then she hires it out and it brings an income, and with that income, she can access all the other things that she needs. And she says at the end, basically the donkey is like me, but to plainly put it, the donkey is me. And there's another a well-known saying in Ethiopia that says a woman without a donkey is a donkey, which, you know, is, is quite heartbreaking in a way because it showed the amount of physical work and daily labor and drudgery that women have, um, having that donkey helps her to elevate herself out of that situation. So these are a couple of recent socioeconomic studies on the use of donkeys. This one was in 2011 in three waradas in the Southern Nations and Nationalities People's Province of Ethiopia, which found that the annual household level return from equine ownership use was about um, 330 US dollars. And very interestingly, that the income generated from working equine animals was 14% of the total income, which was more than that generated from other livestock. So when they started the study, they asked people to rank the importance of their livestock, and donkeys came pretty near the bottom. But when they monetarized the value of the income actually coming in from those animals, that was more than the value that was coming in from meat and milk and other livestock. And they took that back to the community, to the, um, communities that had been part of their focus groups, and when they cross-checked it with them, they said, well, yeah, actually, that's true. You know, when, we, when you work it out like that, yes, that is the case. We, we can see that now. And almost 100% of the animals in this study were used for both for hiring out and in the homestead. So they were, again, dual-use animals. And the savings that the family was making, as well as the earnings on homestead labor, were about $267 a year, which, again, for people living... In, on the poverty line is, is a lot of money. And this is a second study um, done by Chang et al. in 2010 in two areas of Guatemala, um, which showed that particularly for the smallest producers, there was the biggest effect um, from the loss of a working animal. 57% or 45% of their total productive assets um, would be the effect of losing their working horse or mule. And that the value of working animals in cattle raising and agriculture when worked out in cost of transport over two different distances came out as $775 if a daily trip was less than five kilometers or a pretty staggering almost $3,000 um, a year for where trips of five to 10 kilometers a day had to be done for cattle raising or for production of coffee and beans and maize. However, at higher levels, working horses and mules and donkeys are almost completely invisible. In national and international development programs, in livestock programs, they don't appear. You don't hear about how they support other agriculture, how they support women. You can't find them anywhere. You may, in your Oxfam catalogue at Christmas, be able to sponsor a donkey, to buy a donkey for a family. What you're buying is a donkey voucher and, and that's given to the family to buy a donkey, but Oxfam doesn't follow up to see what, what it was, you know, what the donkey was used for, how it contributed. You know, it's not part, it's not on their radar beyond that point. So we find that across a lot of international development programs, the working animals just aren't there. In education, they tend not to be there. Veterinary universities, even in developing countries, will often base their equine curriculum on racehorses or polo horses, even though the vets that are trained will probably never meet those animals, and yet we'll see working animals every day in the streets. They often won't treat them. They, 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 don't know, they don't want to treat them because they don't know enough about them, and the owners don't want to bring them because they know that the vets don't know enough about them. They're not found in legislation. They're not found in national agricultural policies because they're not counted as livestock in a lot of cases. 
They're not found in animal health systems. Um, in livestock statistics, as I say, FAO or national livestock statistics almost never separate out working animals. And there's very little research that's been done or been funded on them. So I'm briefly going to talk about improving the welfare of these animals. And what I could do just now is put up a lot of gory pictures of very thin animals, lame animals, working animals with wounds and so on. But I'm not going to do that because I feel that that tends to, to polarize the discussion and to focus us on the, the very negative parts of the lives of working animals, which happen in some areas but not in others. There are certain areas where you will find that the animals are, most of the working animals are in a terrible state, but that's not the case everywhere. They all have some issues. So I'm going to look at it in terms of risk factors um, for poor welfare and what can be done about those. And this is sometimes affectionately known as the donkey rainbow. Um, it's a a uh, description of the determinants or risk factors for working animal welfare that um, myself and a, and a colleague developed from a human social medicine model. So you can see the first layer of risks involves housing, nutrition, workload, living and working conditions and so on. And that's the layer that's often paid the most attention to, disease prevention and treatment. The second layer of compulsions and constraints is very interesting because this is what really affects owners' behaviour towards and society's behaviour towards their working animals, but particularly owners' behaviour. What knowledge and skills do they have? What belief systems and traditions are underlying the way they treat their working animals? How are they making choices when they only have a limited expenditure? And what are their, the perceived benefits of spending money on a working animal compared to other priorities in life? What are the normative and social systems? What are their peers doing? What are the elders in the village telling them to do? And what is the availability, affordability, accessibility, and quality of the service providers, of the vets, the animal health workers, the farriers, the feed sellers that are available? They may want to do as well as they possibly can by their working animals, but find that, that, that there just isn't a farrier or there isn't a vet available in their area. So the first layer, I'm just going to take a little, a little bit more of a look at, and there, this does include some of the, the, the very stark statistics about um, the problems that working animals have. In a lot of the studies that we've done and in our regular welfare assessments, we find that between 97 and 100 percent of working horses and donkeys in many areas have gait abnormalities, often multi-limb lamenesses with multi, multiple pathologies. We see large, large numbers of wounds associated with harness. We see animals that are fearful, that, have, that are overloaded and overworked. So what can we do about that? One of the things that we can do is look at improving animal health systems, looking at the supply side. So that involves training vets and animal health assistants. That may be supporting government training schemes or training directly, improving the supply chains for medicines and equipment, producing manuals, producing online resources, linking animal owners with feed sellers and saddlers and medical stores. And projects like community first aid boxes, where the community itself can keep some of the things that they need for emergency treatment within the village so they don't have to rely on calling somebody out to, to deal with the um, immediate emergency. So those are looking at the supply of, of improved animal health systems. On the next layer that I talked about... Um, which are some of the underlying or root causes um, for the primary risks. These are the compulsions and constraints um, facing the owners of working animals. One of the things that, that we do is look at identifying a need for quality equine services. So looking at the demand side, how can we use participatory tools and methods to explore the need for better services? How can we help owners to recognize a need and to make sure that that gets put in place, to create a demand for a farrier or for a better feed seller or for a different kind of shoe. We also help to facilitate forming equine welfare and savings groups, um, which enable people to, to gain some of the knowledge and skills that they need and also to, to be able to club together and buy maybe buy feed in bulk or to in the example of community-led tetanus vaccination camps, that the, the community group, the equine welfare group, can ask a community animal health worker to come in and vaccinate several animals at once, make sure, all, make sure they get their full course of vaccinations, um, and pay less 
for that. And we also support Tonga and Gary Horse unions who are getting together again to ask for change in bylaws or to ask for permission for their animals to have somewhere to rest or asking for a tube well in the street so that they can give their animals water and so on. We also use participatory tools and exercises with animal owners and communities. So there, um, this is just um, three examples here from a set of um, participatory action tools for animal welfare, um, which we've developed again mainly from PRA tools in human um, development, but also that some of the animal owners and our field facilitators have come up with themselves. So the one that's illustrated is called If I Were a Horse. And this is where animal owners sit down and talk about what their, if they were a horse, what would be their expectation of their owner? Then what's their owner's present practice on those expectations? And they score that. How well is their owner doing? What effect would that have on the horse's body? Um, so in what way would the animal be ill or lame or injured? And then what signs would they look for? So this leads them towards a participatory monitoring system. When they know what signs they would look for, then they can start to develop an action plan and regular monitoring of the animal's um, health and welfare. The, um, the photograph there was, they're not usually that neat and beautiful, but they had done an exercise outside and they wanted to show us what the final result was using coloured paint powder and so on because they were very proud of what they'd, um, that particular group of, of the work they'd done. That had taken them the best part of a day to discuss and, and, and what had come out of that. Um, how to improve the value of my horse is an exercise where people talk about what they paid for in a group about what they paid for their horses and why there's usually a lot of laughing and a lot of you know babylon you were robbed with that one and but why you know that that brings out the discussion of what it is about a horse a working horse or a donkey that makes it valuable what dividing it down into parts of the body um, or dis different aspects which bring value to the animal and then again generates an action plan of how can we make our animals more valuable how and People will go away, do that for a month or a couple of months, act on those changes, and then come back and discuss and agree amongst themselves, now how much would you pay for my horse if you were buying it in a market? So that's quite a, a big incentive to improve the animal as an asset. An animal feelings analysis, this has come up a couple of times. This was one developed by some of the, the villages in slightly different forms, but this is one of the forms where we were trying to look a little bit more about the sentience of working animals and how to tell uh, something more about their mental welfare. And so this village group developed a scoring system, um, criteria for a happy animal, a medium animal, and a sad animal in their own pictures, in their own words, which they could then monitor over time in order to tell them whether their animals were sad and how they could keep them at the, the medium or the happy end of the spectrum, even when they were working hard. Participatory monitoring and evaluation has been a very important part of our work to improve welfare. So again, once the owners have developed these action plans, they get together and they go round together once a month or once every three months around everybody's animal and try to score, to, to develop a scoring system which tells them whether the animal has improved. And that has led to some very interesting competitive scoring with animals, competitions, best owner, most improved animal, person who helped the worst animal the most. And so in some villages we actually have people kind of fighting to, to improve the welfare of everybody's animal because that you know, will get them the most points in the competition. And it's also led to things like um, insurance um, in savings groups. So people will start to, as the savings group itself, will start to produce um, insurance packages for owners, if you like, where they agree what, what compensation somebody will get if their animal is ill or if their animal dies. But then, because they know it's coming out of their group savings, they become very good at monitoring and keeping an eye on everyone else to make sure their group savings aren't going to be depleted by paying out insurance. So there's been some very interesting developments that have come out of this kind of work. Um, we do do quite a lot of work with women's groups. This is an example from India where the women are talking about a daily calendar and the chores that they do with their animal each day, the kinds of work they have to do, feeding, watering, sweeping the stable, applying medicines and so on, and some of the constraints or barriers or difficulties that they have with doing that and how they can overcome them. And this is an example of the savings groups. I don't know if that table is, is very visible, but... Um, 
this is information from September 2010, which is a little while ago now, but in this example, 54% of the total loans taken from the group's savings were made for animal-related um, payments for veterinary treatment feed, new animals and so on. So they were invested back in the animals. And the other 46% were used for things like paying for weddings, paying for children's education, paying for, for food for the family and so on. So the equine savings group is having benefits directly for the animal and indirectly through helping the, the family in other ways. And finally, I'm just going to mention this outer layer um, of the general socio-economic and cultural and environmental conditions, the background to, um, to, to these risk factors for working animals or determinants. And this is an area which we've started working on more recently with national and international advocacy. And two examples of where this has been successful, one of them is development of an animal welfare directive in Ethiopia. This was with a group of equine welfare organizations, but led by the Ministry of Agriculture in Ethiopia, which has produced basically of the Ethiopia's first animal welfare law, which sits within the, vet the proclamation on veterinary services, which is the equivalent of a, an act in the UK. I'm not sure if it would be the same in Canada. And um, this has taken three or four years to really get going, but now it's, it's being ratified by the government and they will start to develop secondary legislation under that. And that was started off with the interest in working animals because of this huge population. Although it will be a, a law that encompasses all species and all uses, it was working animals which started the ball rolling with that one. And also the World Organization for um, Animal Health is starting to put together an ad hoc group to produce welfare standards for working equine animals. So that's very exciting new development which is, is starting this year and we're hoping that the 178 members of the OIE member states will ratify that over the next couple of years as it goes through the OIE process. So those are some examples of working on the, on the higher level to improve welfare in this group of animals. So I've got a couple of pages of references which you'll be able to find on the slides when they come out after the symposium. Um, I would ask you to have a quick look at these books. I wasn't able to bring any to sell, but do come and have a look at them at some point um, in the break. The Working Equid Veterinary Manual is our very recent um, book which has been produced as the result of a wiki vet, an internal wiki vet among the, the veterinary staff of the Brook, where they have put together the content, they've brought case studies, they've put together their own photos. So we now have a veterinary manual that's specific for the conditions of working equids, and it's put together by vets who specialize in this area. And the other one is Sharing the Load, which I and three colleagues um, wrote a couple of years ago, which talks about our experiences of three years in developing equine welfare groups in India and what they've been able to achieve, and also has about 30 participatory action tools for animal welfare in the back, which can be adapted for all sorts of situations where you're working with communities on improving the welfare of various species. We don't sell these directly ourselves through the Brook, but I've got some contacts there um, of how to get them. Tamsin is the direct contact for the Working Equid Veterinary Manual because she would like you to, she would like to be in touch with you so you can carry on contributing if you're someone that works with working animals in any sense. She wants you involved in her wiki, so she wants to know who you are. Um, and this one we don't sell directly, but you can get it for the princely sum of 25 Canadian dollars from Amazon. So, and if you speak French, Spanish, Hindi, or Urdu, it's free online. So thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to, to leave you with this quote from Ganesh Pandey, who's the convener of one of our partner organizations in Uttar Pradesh in India. And I think it sums up everything that I've been saying. We know that for the whole world, it might only be a donkey, mule, or horse, but for the poor owner, it is the whole world. Thank you very much. <laughs>